I'm going to introduce someone now who, again, is going to provide us with uh, an interesting um, perspective because I think, you know, what happens at government level it is obviously the way that we can um, effect very powerful change. Um, and it takes the feedback from people like yourselves and a community to help people working in government really understand what should we do. Um, so to talk about Labour's digital strategy and their new digital democracy um, strategy, I'd like to introduce Louise Hay. Um, and I know that she's going to be talking a little bit about how she uses digital to interact with her constituents. Louise. Thank you, um, Maggie, and thank you to the Tinder Foundation for inviting me over to speak with you all this morning. Um, I took on the job as Shadow Minister for the Digital Economy uh, just over a month ago, and since then I've met with um, a wide range of tech enthusiasts and corporate stakeholders um, and commercial operators. The issues in my brief that sit under the Digital Economy title are varied, um, they're challenging, but they're of the absolute utmost importance to our society and to our economy and there's few people that understand this more than the people in this room so as much as I enjoy meeting with all those corporate stakeholders it's a particular privilege um, to be here with you all today to speak to people that work on the front line deal with these issues um, on a daily basis and so when we move on to the q and I'd be really interested to hear about your own experiences and as Maggie said to feed into me so I can take those to the government and to feed them into our policy development as well. Um, and of course it's an honour to be part of a conference with people who have understood the power of the digital revolution to make a genuine difference in communities that we all represent and work every day to make uh, better. From Nick Atkin at the Halton Housing Trust who is leading efforts to get 90% of customers accessing services online by 2018 and helping to become more responsive to the need of tenants in the process. To Catherine Flagner, who is leading on projects to engage people with learning and physical disabilities to improve their digital skills in Cumbria. Every single one of you will bring stories like this to today. And they're being repeated across the country by thousands of individuals and organisations working hard at the sharp end of the digital transformation to change the lives of those who are too often left behind. And that is embodied in the work of the Tinder Foundation and I'm pleased to see it renamed today as the Good Things Foundation. Every single person uh, I said I was coming to speak at this conference today um, asked why I was coming to talk about online dating and made a joke about Grindr or something like that. And I've got nothing, uh, nothing against, I actually met my partner on, uh, on Tinder, but it's good to see that, um, <laughs> that it's been cleared up today. Um, and so it's really, I see it, my job um, to make sure that these issues and the issues that you're all facing on a daily basis are at the top of the agenda in Westminster where they, quite frankly, haven't been given sufficient priority uh, for too long. Because as was starkly put by the Social Mobility Commission last week in a report which has, I'm afraid, been studiously avoided by the government, our country has reached a critical point and the rungs on the ladder of social mobility are growing further apart. And that's because deep-seated problems in our country's economy over many years are coming to fruition. And it's causing an entrenched social divide between, for not just people within communities, but for whole communities themselves. So take my city um, of Sheffield, for instance. A young girl born in my constituency can look down the hill, we've got lots of hills in Sheffield, can look down the hill to um, another little girl born in the west of Sheffield uh, who can expect to get better qualifications, earn a higher wage and live on average seven years longer just because of the postcode she was born into. And the reasons for this are not complicated. Most people here today will have first-hand experience of dealing with them and of trying to tackle the consequences of these reasons. Because at the heart of the problem is the gap between the skilled workforce and the unskilled, those with qualifications and those without. It's the 
chronic issues of low pay, of dedicated, hard-working parents working all the hours they can for next to nothing. And then when their children reach just four years old, that social divide is already solidifying. By the end of secondary school, they're far less likely than their wealthier peers to have good qualifications and poor careers advice and slashes to further education budgets lead to low paid work as well. That's wrong and it gets most of us, I'd imagine in this room, pretty angry. And yes, we now live in an age where it's far easier to blame than to solve, but there are things we can do and pretty radical changes that are at our fingertips that we can implement. A real living wage, we hear the government talk about the national living wage, I'm sure nobody in this room needs telling, it's nothing of the sort, it's an increase um, to the minimum wage. So a real living wage that means that people can get a fair, uh, fair day's uh, pay for a fair day's work. A massive expansion in high quality childcare, a doubling of the pupil premium and targeting it at early years so parents get the support they need early on and public funding for adult learners to retrain or get the skills they need. Politicians of all persuasions, I would argue, are still only skirting around the edge of the digital revolution you are all firmly part of. And for many, the transformative change it will usher in is only just beginning to become clear. And a few figures paint a very stark picture of this. 700,000 better paid intermediate skilled jobs have gone in the last decade. And if current trends continue, technological change in the future could make that situation worse, not better. Nine million low-skilled people could be chasing four million uh, relevant jobs. And meanwhile, perversely, there will be a shortage of three million workers to fill 15 million high-skilled jobs by 2022. And that's obviously why the work you're all doing so uh, matters so much. And it's not just important, it's absolutely urgent. Because with 12.6 million people in the UK lacking basic digital skills, if we do not quickly embrace the technological change, we risk the exact same communities who were left behind when our manufacturing bases collapsed, being left behind as our digital economy continues to gather apace. So for Labour, digital access and digital inclusion is an issue of social justice as well. It gets to the heart of why we're here and what we're all about. A Labour Party that was formed from the first Industrial Revolution wants to make sure that we fight for the opportunities for everyone in the fourth. And I have said time and time again to the government minister, to the House, to anyone that will listen, this fourth industrial revolution has the enormous potential to be the driver of the most profound change and the most startling force for social good that we have ever seen. But at the moment, social exclusion and digital exclusion go hand in hand with some 60% of those without basic digital skills also having no qualifications whatsoever. And the UK government has removed access to free learning for most adults, and the adult education budget is suffering a real terms cut. For older adults, the government will only fund digital training up to GCSE, offering no opportunity for the vast majority of people to retrain and get a job in the process. Now, we need a bold programme which targets communities left behind for three decades and brings the benefits of the digital revolution directly to them. That's why we back the 800 million programme first suggested by this foundation to get Britain as close as possible to the 100% basic digital literacy we need, making sure no one is left behind. And it's why we're calling on the government to urgently introduce new policies that move people from low pay to a living wage by acquiring new skills. It's why we back the introduction of a second chance career fund to help older workers at risk from technological change to retrain and why we think public funding should be made available to people over the age of 24 with low skills who want to retrain and get into skilled work. We were pleased to see the government bring forward amendments to the Digital Economy Bill last month that would ensure basic um, training for, for adults, but we need to go further. And here's a way the twin, twin track of the digital revolution can be transformative for our young people. There are nearly 16,000 qualifications for 16 to 19 year olds 
It's quite frankly dizzying and off-putting. And if we're honest, all too often, it matches young adults just starting off in life to relatively low-paid jobs with little prospect of getting on. So we think government should use big data to crunch which qualifications reward the most and which qualifications meet the needs of the economy and publish it so young people can see for themselves what the gold standard qualifications are and they can make their own informed decisions based on the outputs of those. The digital revolution should benefit those communities who have had to wait too long for change. There is absolutely no reason why that little girl growing up in my constituency, if given half a chance and the skills she needs, cannot ride this wave of technological transformation and break out of the low pay cycle, which has caused such harm for three generations. Because digital skills can be the vanguard against hollowing, the hollowing out of the workforce that we're currently seeing, whether it's Uber, who refuse to treat their drivers as employees or even workers, despite the fact that they recruit, they train, and they negotiate the terms and conditions on which they're based. Or ASOS, who have an incredible HQ here in London with highly paid executives and designers, but yet rely on factory workers in Grimethorpe, near Sheffield, uh, who are on low pay, zero hour contracts, and don't even enjoy basic health and safety at work. We need to ensure that we're skilling up a generation of workers that aren't exploited, that don't, uh, that don't just rely on those low paid and very insecure works to make uh, jobs to make sure that they have the opportunities to progress in, the, in work. And on public services, the digital transformation could help address inequalities that could mean healthcare, for instance, is delivered in a completely different way online triage with authoritative information backed up with e-consultations. Apps are already being used to help manage long-term conditions, offering lifestyle advice and helping to improve outcomes. What is happening in Canada through a different system altogether offers a potential insight with access to digital health records and the opportunity to view and control your own information online. Here we have struggled to embrace it with multiple scandals around data and government's handling of data and those failures have knocked the public's confidence in government and data but the benefits if properly managed are obvious. A 2013 report showed the opportunities for channel shift across local government and the NHS and estimated potential savings to the government of three billion pounds a year. So Labour are clear. Digital inclusion is our social mission. It's about a good job for that little girl in Sheffield, a quality health service for everyone and everything in between. And above all, it's a chance to right the wrongs of the last three generations where too many people didn't get a chance and to do things differently now. Children are growing up today in the midst of an information revolution unimaginable a decade ago with instant access to an astonishing range of content and information. Researchers suggest that children are taking in five times more information than my generation, which grew up in the not-so-distant 1990s. Far from the tabloid stories about a distracted generation, those growing up today are on course to be the most informed in history. If that can be harnessed, then we really could be on the cusp of a social revolution, and my party and I will work alongside all of you every step of the way to make that happen. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm going to pick up my, my favourite toy. Um, and do we have any, any questions? <coughs> While you um, have a sort of like a, a reflection, a moment to reflect and think, um, I've just picked up something on, on Twitter, oh. um, which comes from, I don't know whether he's here or whether he's a following online, um, from Ryan McCur McMurdo. Um, anyway, the question is... Um, what did Labour think of the budget and the amount of money allocated for digital? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, well, what, what, what money was allocated to digital? There was the, um, the one billion um, in terms of broadband infrastructure, but that, as far as I can tell, is a rehashing of, of um, the same amount of money that was announced in last year's autumn statement and hasn't been spent yet. Um, the government 
uh, talk a good game on, uh, on, on broadband and on um, investment in digital infrastructure, but so far haven't put their money where their mouth is. So we're, we're very pleased to see a commitment to ultra-fast broadband, but the money suggested would only deliver it to 2 million homes, which is obviously um, a tiny uh, drop in the ocean, when we've still got, I think it's 20%, of the UK's geography not even able to access um, voice and text coverage, let alone ultra, super fast or ultra fast broadband. So we'd like to see the government much more ambitious and we've been talking about these issues in the Digital Economy Bill as well over the last couple of um, months because they've delivered a universal service obligation that will guarantee everyone the right to 10 megabits per second by 2020, which given uh, the European Commission believe that that speed uh, that everyone should enjoy should be 30 megabits um, is really not ambitious enough at all. So we want to see them um, improving the competitiveness of the um, broadband infrastructure market um, and committing proper public um, funding behind it as well. <coughs> yeah, so, so that sort of access to broadband is a really massive um, stumbling block. Um, the, the second thing, and I'd really appreciate some feedback from the audience here. Um, my, my sister works in Market Harbour, does a lot of work with people who are, um, live in rural areas, um, particularly pe older people who feel sort of, well, are socially um, excluded. And um, they, they try to match up their Befrienders programme with getting people online. It makes a lot of sense. But one of the barriers she's experienced is people going, well, why would I pay? What's it worth? And, and that um, I, I just wondered whether anyone in the audience had that experience. So it's not just about the being able to get online. It's not about having the tools, you know, the iPads or the phone. It's actually paying that extra cost. You know, I don't know whether, whether you get sort of this, whether you encounter this as a stumble block, stumbling block, but if, if anyone in the audience encounters this, it'd be great to, to hear from you, know, from you on that. You, you're nodding up at the back. You, hang on a minute. <laughs> right, just a second. Apparently, if I put a spin on this, you know, <laughs> my, my, my lovely dad, who sadly died in the summer, he was a cricketer. He would be so ashamed of me at this moment. <laughs> I can't tell you. Right. I, 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 look, you know, I, I will give things a go, right. <laughs> well, you know, I'm sorry, Dad, is all I can say. But let's hear your question. Um, yeah, I do quite a bit of work with people who are digitally excluded. And um, cost is a factor, but I think it's persuading people to see it in terms of being an investment. But for our low-income households, like uh, social housing tenants, £50 is a lot of money. Um, and expecting someone to sort of pay out for that and persuade them that it, it's worth doing is, is quite a challenge. But I think it's more than that. It, the, we see it a lot with older people, is they self-limit on what they're willing to go online for. So we've been breaking up the problem into like basic digital skills, just focused on confidence, i.e. you're only going to break it if you drop it, so <laughs> let's get over that, and picking away at those other self-imposed barriers, which are stopping people seeing it as an in investment. So it, it, it's breaking it up in that way and, and sort of going, okay, right, you want to email to keep in contact with relatives? What about social media? What about talking to the relatives around the world and sort of pitching it and then suddenly that becomes worth investing some money in to be able to do that. But it's too big a thing to sell the internet to get people to see they, it's something that's worth spending that, that cash on. So it's breaking it down. Apologies if I'm a bit rambly, but it's more complicated than just cash. We were talking about this a little bit um, just before, weren't we, about the marketing um, of digital? Because whenever I tell anybody I'm the shadow minister for the digital economy, they pull a face. Um, I was with a colleague who was saying, "Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm the new shadow minister for Brexit." And they go, "Oh, that's really interesting." I said, "Well, I'm, and I'm digital economy." And, oh my goodness, that's really hard. I'd much rather be the shadow minister for the digital economy than for Brexit at the moment. <laughs> um, but I'd be really interested to hear how that's been successful. That's a really good um, uh, example. 
of how you've managed to break down those barriers with people to make them uh, make them get beyond this thing of like, oh, digital, no, that's not for me. And as you've just really clearly said about people self-limiting um, in that, I think it's a really it's an enormous barrier. Yeah, clearly my throws are just not being trusted. <laughs> <anymore>. <laughs> get this the right way up it'll be a start hi maggie um and uh louise as well uh, i'm john perkins i'm from dot everyone we've been doing some work down in croydon and lewisham testing ways in which we can help those um people typically in the lower social demographic uh, elements of uh, society in terms of how basic digital skills can uh, can improve their lives and bring them into the into the online world that we've spoken about so much this morning. Um, there's been a lot of work done on measuring the financial inclusion elements of that. Lloyd's published a report uh, earlier on this year that said it's worth £744. For many, many families that are to use the current vernacular, you know, just about managing, uh, that is a huge amount of money. But it is, as, as uh, the lady up there said, it is an investment point of view. Um, I think the time has really come to start measuring it in different ways, that we need to get away from just talking about financial benefits to start talking about some of the social benefits that can be derived in terms of tackling loneliness amongst older people, in terms of talking about social inclusion, and talk about improving kids' education through having not only broadband access at home or 5G access is likely to come through in the next couple of years, but equally importantly to make sure that people have access to affordable equipment. You know, appreciate the price of kit is coming down, but it's still you know, a big outlay for an awful lot of families. But equally, and we've touched on this several times already this morning, the, uh, the ability to learn those basic digital skills. And that doesn't come down, as, as we know, to uh, everybody here knows, uh, to just talking about tech. Absolutely the wrong conversation to have. It is about motivation. You know, if, if I wasn't sitting here talking to you now, what would you be doing as a hobby? And you can talk to 100 different people and get 100 different answers. And I think there needs to be a greater realisation uh, in government circles, certainly, to, uh, to understand that and to start stop talking just about broadband or indeed 5G and to actually start, start talking about the, the wider picture that is actually needed. Um, well, I completely um, agree. I think um, there are enormous benefits clearly for, um, that reach far beyond the financial, not, not least in, in, in uh, managing your own health. Um, and care needs as well, as I sort of very briefly touched on. I think we need to have that debate in a wider one about um, people's data um, and how that's being used and in some cases obviously commodified because I don't think there's anywhere near enough uh, the level of understanding there when people are using their Fitbits and their health apps, um, how that data is, uh, is owned and uh, commodified and sold on. So I think we need to have that um, debate quite urgently because there really is not enough understanding about it. And I'm, I really worry that there's going to be another major scandal, uh, much bigger than Care.Data, but in a similar vein, and government going to have to respond and overreact, as governments always do, and they're going to clamp down on the innovation and all the amazing uh, potential benefits that we can have in that space. But I think that we, ne we also need to move on between this just being siloed as you know uh, the digital economy sitting in. For some reason, it sits in the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, but we need to see it really being being uh, being championed across the whole of government, rather than just one ministerial responsible. Uh, responsible. When you see politicians uh, everywhere taking it on, rather than just leaving it to me and Matt Hancock. <laughs> um, again, it's a question over. I mean, there's a challenge. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right, you ready? That's good. <laughs> you can <it>. yeah. <laughs> Doing your your little bit to keep us fitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, a number of us in this room today are from library services, and even more library services probably aren't represented here because they've decided they can't afford to send a delegate. And um, I'm wondering how much you see. Well, I guess it goes. I need to say as part of that that the last five years especially, uh, library services have been going through a massive funding crisis. And at the same time, we're seeing all these digital by default assumptions that are leading to people being sent to our centres. Um, so I'm wondering how much you see representing library services as part of your role 
and what you think you can do to encourage the government to do that too. Yeah, I mean, councils are in such an invidious situation at the moment, aren't they? Just basically having to fund their basic statutory services and struggling to do that even in the vast majority of cases with social care um, in such crisis. Um, it, the, the budgets have, this year in Sheffield will have overspent, I know, um, and they're becoming in... Uh, I mean, we've, we've been talking about it in terms of crisis for the last six years, but I think we overuse that word, but we really are in that, in that kind of state now. And in Sheffield, um, we've kept every library open, but some of them are run by volunteers. Um, and actually, they've really thrived, some of those volunteer-run libraries, and it's incredible um, to see the communities rally around them and uh, really take those services forward and be, be really imaginative in the services they provide and work much uh, more closely with the community than perhaps the, the uh, <coughs> previous service had, had been run. However, you know, that, that goes with the tenant that it should be a statutory service and that it should be for the, uh, the taxpayer to fund. Um, and I, I host my surgeries. I've got three libraries in my constituency, which I'm very proud of. I host my surgeries there in order to promote them, promote um, footfall. Um, and I'm working with the council on their library consultation at the moment. So it's, I think it's absolutely um, in our job to promote libraries and to make that case for government because the work you do, in, in particularly in some of the most deprived communities, is, uh, is absolutely vital. And I think it's you know, an absolute travesty that we've seen libraries being forced to close over the last six years. And I think the campaign around that at the time was really important in, ho in uh, highlighting the importance of the work, the work that you do. So thank you, anyone here that works in libraries, for the fantastic work that you do day in, day out. Yeah. I'm going to... Sorry, it's on, the Dan. loops yeah, I got near it, yeah. Um, we're talking about individuals having to understand that they need to invest to save, and you're clearly passionate, and I think a lot of what you've said chimes with the feelings of the people in this room. That I'm really happy to hear you say that your Labour Party is still supporting the Labour Digital Report from last year, only last year, when we had the general election. Um, and it's clear that if the government invested in basic digital skills for the whole population, that they would save substantial amounts of money and we would have social policy that was much more effective and would be engaging many more people in our society who need to have that intervention and those public services. So what more do you think we could do to persuade the government to spend that money? Because if we're saying individuals should invest to save, why can't the government see that they have to do that too? Yeah. It's, it's the age-old debate we have, isn't it, to invest, to save, and there's so many areas of social policy where investment in early intervention measures and preventative measures are obviously, um, obviously cheaper and more effective and produce better policy than, uh, than tackling the symptoms at the end. I mean, our entire health service is essentially set up to deal with the acute problems at the end rather than investing in preventative measures, which is why we could throw money at the NHS forever and it still wouldn't be um, as effective as it could be without completely transforming the way it, the way it treats people. Um, so I think, you know, as, as with anything in politics, um, just hammering it over and over again. You might be bored of saying it, but it still, <laughs> won't, have been, um, it still won't have been heard because that's, uh, you know, with the panoply of issues that are debated and how so many issues that are so important at the moment with public spending cuts still biting in areas that I represent and across the UK. Everything's competing for airtime and for priority all the time. So lobby your own MPs to raise this. And I think the work that the Good Things Foundation has been doing with the Work and Pensions Select Committee, um, all getting that on the parliamentary agenda is absolutely vital. And as I said, to raise it with different departments to show them the, the benefits to policy making and to and to government efficiency as well, um, just really hammering it over and over and over again. And I promise to keep doing that as well. I'm, I will never be bored of saying it. <laughs> Do you think, though, um, 
that enough people in government genuinely get it, <laughs> as opposed to pay lip service and yeah. then think it doesn't really matter. Because things like, say, um, the, you know, say like HS2, um, and, uh, you know, what could happen with that is, yes, we do have this amazing corridor and this high-speed train taking people with skills from London mm. up to an area where we should have been investing to give them skills so that that wasn't perhaps so necessary. Mm. You know, and that's the thing that... So you, they kind of get the infrastructure, but they don't get the digital yeah. infrastructure. Uh, I've, and I've been making that analogy as well, you know, saying we're, we're looking at very outdated approach really of moving people around rather than investing in the broadband infrastructure and moving data around much more quickly and, and actually my fear around HS2 is um, not just that you could b bring people up is that actually you could drag more people back down to London and we do still have a very London centric approach um, to policy making uh, at the beginning of the year the government announced they were closing the only policy making centre outside of London which is in Sheffield and moving all those policy making jobs um, back down to Whitehall and ironically they're the policy civil servants that work on the Northern Powerhouse so um, they're going to be based in, uh, in London from now on and I just think um, it's damaging to our democracy, it's damaging to our economy to have everyone who's making decisions <coughs> about government and about the way the country is run based in London and obviously I have nothing against London but you do have a very different perspective on the country if you've been, if you only work there rather than if you're working in, in the regions and so no I don't think I, I don't think the whole of government gets it, and you, uh, you can see the consequences of that at the moment with the dismantling of the government digital service that sits in the Cabinet Office. It had a huge champion in Francis Maud under the, under the last Parliament, but I think government has lost interest in it now, and I think that's a great shame because it was doing really impressive, progressive things to transform um, the digitisation of government. So I think it's, I think it's actually... Uh, we've lost some of those champions um, within government... At, um, in the loss of Francis Maud, um, which is, uh, I think, a backward step. Um, so it's, I think it's incumbent on all of us to really promote this, as I say, across all of government to make sure that it is firmly on their agenda and they can't just silo it in one bit and say that's the digital bit. Actually, it's important for everything, all policy areas. Absolutely. Um, I'm just looking around to see if there's another question from the audience because... Um, There's someone uh, hiding behind this washroom. Here. Oh, right. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Actually, I think we would have a new thing where people need to shout oi very loudly yeah. and then I will know you've got the question. OK. Hi. Hi, I'm Chris Golden from Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Um, I was wondering if you had a view about how the government is handling the digital aspects of universal credit rollout. Huh. In particular, the kind of uh, access in the full service and the, uh, some of the feed-ins of real-time information on earnings that are coming from HMRC. Um, well, I think <laughs> yeah, universal credit rollout. Was the NAO reckon that it's going to take 300 years at the current pace for it to be um, to be complete? So. Um, Hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll have it within my lifetime <laughs> as a parliamentarian. But um, the, uh, I, mean, I, I think HMRC have actually been doing pretty well on the digital agenda. I was looking at their personal tax por portal the other day and their app that they use. I think um, com comparatively with the rest of government, they're, doing, they're obviously investing significant amounts of money in their making tax digital strategy. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of people that are going to, um, going to point out why that's not the case and I'd be very um, very pleased to hear from you if you don't think that's the case um, but I think HMRC are kind of leading the way on this um, in, in government um, but I haven't um, to be honest um, seen that much about the digitisation particularly of universal credit so I'd be interested to hear what you, what you think the, the problems are I'm sure there are very many problems as there are with the whole of universal credit and that's because they've, sh they've cut back again the civil servants that are working on this in the DWU um, Whitehall is so fundamentally unequipped at the moment to deal with issues like this that require forward thinking and with all the challenges of Brexit as we've heard over the last couple of weeks with the former head of White, uh, Whitehall, Sir Bob Kerslake and the Institute for Government um, the, we really need to reinvest in our civil servants again to make sure that we've got the in-house expertise particularly on digital because I think there is this attitude that you outsource it out um, you, you don't need the skills, and, but we don't even have the skills to manage those outsourced 
um, projects as well, as we've seen with um, the Concentrics debacle with HMRC recently, which completely mishandled um, that tax credits contract because we didn't have the, the resources in-house to manage the, that outsourced contract and to keep that private, private contractor in line. I mean, I would, I would say on HMRC that I think tax may be good, but I think tax credits are probably not yeah. as good because they don't want to invest in it because they know it's going over to DWP and being subsumed by universal credit, but there's obviously mm -hmm. going to be people on it for longer now than, than anticipated for, for yeah. several years. And uh, the universal credit uh, service was originally outsourced and then brought in-house, and I think they had quite a good team working on it. But the key, the key thing is and I, I think they know this, that it has to be smartphone first for claimants to be able to engage with it. So if it doesn't work on that, then mm. uh, it's not going to work at all. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks very much for that question. Um, and we will now break for lunch. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, what have you... Okay. Yeah. No, no, because we're recording it, so then we'll hear your question properly. Nice. Oh. <laughs> Hi, my name's Jaya. I work in um, Hammersmith and Fulham. I work for Citizens Advice. We are the only CA in the country that also run a library service. So, hi, libraries. Um, we understand that people won't come to us if they don't get free help with digital inclusion. So that's answering the question came, came up earlier. But the question we really have here is about people who speak English um, not as a first language, because a lot of people come in through our doors, they need help going online, we can show them Learn My Way, we can show them gov.uk, but they can't read the forms because they're not in English. And there's no provision made for that service. And when they go down to their local JCP, they get sent back to us and we have to sit with them. Universal Credit has gone live in our borough. It takes two hours to fill in an online application and all of our time spent by our volunteers is filling out these forms. So we want to know what provision, if any, has been made by yourselves or maybe by good things to accommodate this need. Yeah, I think my citizen's advice in Sheffield, they've got something like 20 different languages spoken um, in, in terms of the, the staff that are providing that help. It's at, and the, the funding for ESOL courses has obviously been cut as well. So I think you're going to be seeing that absolutely more and more, aren't you? And I imagine you have seen a spike um, in the last few years. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's definitely an issue I'll, I'll take back. I didn't realise it took two hours to fill in the universal credit yeah. application. That's absolutely astonishing. Yeah. I'll, um, as everyone's saying, at least, yeah. that more, <laughs> more even. Yeah. Uh, I'll take that back to government and I'll certainly raise the, um, the issue Thank around uh, English as a second language as well. Thank you. And, and Helen, can I, I just ask, I mean, is there, I mean, I know it's difficult, but is there a plan for like a drop down thing? Which language would you like this information to come in? From your point of view. Sorry. <laughs> I, tried. I tried to catch it. Um, so the quick answer is no, um, but uh, Google just announced that Google Translate for 10 languages is now using AI and machine learning. And so they think that it is almost as good as a human translator. Um, and so one thing, um, James is head of digital, he's here, he doesn't know this yet. Um, but one thing I'd quite like to look at is, therefore, how could we easily translate into those 10 languages using mm. something like Google Translate? They may not, of course, be the languages that you need in your CAB, um, but um, that uh, at least it's a way of getting the technology to do yes. that heavy lifting because translating everything into all of the languages that we need. Um, I mean, the answer I always give when I'm asked about um, English as a second language, I think is actually that's where the power of the blended learning and the power of the network comes in because the number of langu languages spoken in the online centers network is phenomenal and therefore it's about people helping people to use the internet in English. Um, on the whole, and therefore learn my way in English is a good way, and we make sure the language is super simple, that there's audio to read it out to you if you can't read the words on the screen. Um, so actually our, our approach has always been to actually help people to do it in English. I do want to make a plug though for English My Way, so we do have an ESOL programme as well. 
Uh, it's an online platform for tutors and volunteers to use to help people who don't speak English to learn how to speak English. So it's a English language learning program, um, but you know it's a 92-week program, so you know you're not going to be able to do it in two hours when they need to get on universal credit today. Brilliant, great, thank you very much. Um, I just want to add that not only for uh, second language that's the problem, because I work with English people mainly, and they cannot read. Mm. And that's the learning my way is really, really good, because there is the audio, which helps. So maybe that should be done for the forms as well. Mm -hmm. OK. Can I ask you to show your appreciation for Louise Hay? Thank you so much, Louise.